Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to run through um, some thoughts here. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a, a copy of the paper in the chat. So um, not trying to be completely exhaustive in this. So think of it, the, the, the presentation is a teaser. So what I want to do, and, and there will be links, I hope they'll be obvious with some of the work that was presented yesterday and, and some of the, the things that we, we've seen today from, uh, from Christopher and, and Jan uh, so far. Uh, what I'm interested in is, um, I'm interested in ground clearing. Uh, at least my, my approach is when I, when I try to you know, work on new areas, build new things, I like to clear the ground to make sure that, that, that it's, a, it's a stable foundation to build things. And this comes from the fact that entrepreneurship is a, is a very uh, unique in the sense that people have come into entrepreneurship uh, from all, all kinds of different areas. So they, they could come from economics, psychology, uh, sociology, anthropology, if you wish, and, and other sciences. And, and they bring different concepts. And these concepts have a lot of baggage with them because they're embedded in the way they're used in a particular language of the, of the originating discipline. And if you've ever played uh, Lego, um, play with Lego when you open the box with someone's played before you, you reach and you want to get pieces that you want to work with. And when you get a piece, you realize that there's lots of other pieces attached to the pieces that you want. So one of the things you do is you shake off all these other pieces and you isolate the pieces you want and you want to build from there. So this is in the spirit of that uh, is uh, I'm going to I'm going to share the things that I, I will now. So let me start uh, with a teaser and also saying that you might hear trains that pass by here. So uh, it's the nature of being high up in the way tra uh, sound travels. But they're usually fast to go through. So I'll start with an appetizer. It's one of my favorite stories of a, of a man uh, who, who um, in the 70s won the Spanish National Lottery. Um, and he spent uh, several months hunting for a ticket ending in 48. He found a ticket, bought it, and won the lottery afterwards. And when he was asked why he was so keen on finding that particular ticket, he said, well, I dreamt of the number seven for seven nights in a row, and seven times seven is 48. And hence, I went on this, on this hunt for the ticket. Now, this story, um, I like it. It's from the book by Mubusin called um, The Success Equation. The story is used there to illustrate the distinction between skill and luck. I'd like to uh, use the story as a way of drawing a distinction between explaining why people do certain things and explaining the consequences of their actions. So one of the things that is clear from this story is that the intention of finding a ticket ending in 48 has a clear causal effect on the actions of the person and on being in possession of a ticket, of this particular ticket. However, the fact that that ticket ended up winning the lottery is no, it cannot be explained by that intention. So we could be stating that the man has certain intentions and versus stating that the intention was based on the wrong premise. It's the kind of evaluation that we do from the outside. We cannot blame the intention of the person. This is what explained the person's actions. And one of the interesting things about actions is that what we do is subject to different descriptions. And an action is intentional only under some descriptions and not others. So for instance, if I describe as the person is searching for a ticket ending in 48, that's an intentional action. If I describe the person is winning the lottery, that's not an intentional action because the description of the action comes outside of the action space of the person. So with this, in, uh, what, what I'd like to draw here is this distinction between, again, explaining what people do and explaining the outcomes or the consequences of the actions that they do. These are two different, uh, if you wish, causally explanatory frameworks. Uh, and they just happen to intersect in the space in which we operate. And in, in trying to, to build things up, I'd like to go back to uh, Venkat's 97 paper, The Distinct Domain of, of, of Entrepreneurship. Uh, and of course, you see that the title of this paper is a, is a play on that title. And one of the points that was made there was that um, there are insufficient explanations of entrepreneurial success. Why do new products and services come out in the economy? This is something that uh, economists, psychologists and the rest, they cannot really explain. And this was defined as, you know, this is the domain in which uh, we can, we can learn, uh, pose research questions and look to build explanations. And one of the powerful ideas from that, uh, from that paper is this idea of a nexus between 
enterprising individuals and lucrative opportunities. I take this um, for two key ideas. The first one is we cannot really talk about entrepreneurship without human initiative. So if there's no human initiatives, the entrepreneurship doesn't happen. But the second one is to explain the outcomes of what people do requires broader considerations about the economy and, and competition and all these other things. Again, you can see that hopefully that this resonates with the opening examples. And what often happens, and this is where a lot of discussions have become kind of blind, uh, side sidetracked, is when we seek this direct grasp of opportunities, it often means that we lose sight of the action space of the people who are on the on the ground and trying to do these things. And if we if we take this as a, as a tension, do we want to explain action? And that means losing sight of the outcomes, not worry about what the outcomes are. When I explain, why do people do the things that they do? Or do we want to explain why, given the things that were done, why these things ended up being successful or failing? These are two different things. Well, I, where I want to focus with this paper, and, and, and a lot of my work has been focused on that, it just becomes now explicit, is I want to focus on the action space. So my goal here is to make entrepreneurial action, the action of the people, intelligible. And that means that I cannot be interested in what happens down the line, whether these things succeed or not, because, because that involves different uh, causal explanations. So to build things up, um, I wanna, wanna build on basically five premises, which I think are very, very intuitive um, as to not require justification. So one, entrepreneurship involves a person, that should be clear. Uh, and of course, what is also clear is that not everyone is entrepreneur and not everyone, not, and an entrepreneur is not an entrepreneur all the time. So right now, even if I'm running a venture right now, I'm a, I'm a researcher talking to colleagues and in an hour I'll be a parent, uh, not necessarily doing my entrepreneurial thing. A person is an entrepreneur, not by virtue of, of who she, he or she is, but by virtue of what he or she does. So that, that, that much is clear as well. However, an activity is entrepreneurial, not by virtue of its performativity, whether you know, I could be pitching and I could be an entrepreneurial pitch or I could be a managerial pitch or I could be a, a, a different pitch. I could be pitching. So what makes it entrepreneurial is the meaning of what happens. And now when it comes to meaning, meaning comes from what a person is trying to do. So we're talking about this intended future state of affairs. Now let's reserve that word opportunity for now. And, and it's something that a person can articulate as a motive for what they're trying to do. So if you ask someone, what are you doing? If I'm able to give you an explanation, that, that's, my, that's my motif. That's the, that's the intentional description of the action, uh, an answer to the question, what are you doing now? And of course, what I just did is a person is a loop from person to action to meaning and back to person. So we can see how we're, we're, we're operating here in a loop. When we talk about meaning, um, this is a, a classic work by, by Lev Vygotsky. Um, this was, of course, this happened in the, in the 30s. Uh, but the work from, it wasn't translated from Russian into English until the 70s. So this is Mind and Society, uh, the seminal book. And one of the things that I take from that book is that with the development of abstract thought, and this is something that happens with people around the age of, with kids around the age of four, with the development of abstract thought, we begin to separate meaning from objects. So up until that point, uh, there is an union, uh, as you call it, a union of motives as perception. So if you see little children, they cannot really disentangle perceptions from the, from the environment in which, in which they are. With abstract thought, we're able to separate uh, meaning and objects, which means that when we invert that, meaning begins to, do to uh, dominate action. And with a given meaning, we can relate that meaning to different objects. So if I have the meaning of the concept of a horse, I can relate it to a stick and begin to write it, take a chair and begin to write a chair and do other things because I have the concept that I relate to different objects. And you can deploy that, that idea to uh, action more generally that we can see uh, when we talk about intention, it's a case where meaning dominates action. And in a given space of meaning and motive, we can have different actions that are all linked together. They can be performed over time. They're all linked together by this sense of overall motive or intention. And uh, Vygotsky uses the, the, the term imaginary situation. And this is a simple idea that when you do something, uh, you're, you're in effect acting in an imaginary situation. You're imagining um, aspirations, futures, values, beliefs, all these things that are, that are in a way give meaning to what, to what you do. So it's not, it's not stuff that can be observed from the, from the outside. 
And with this sense and idea of intention, we're then going into, um, we, can, we can see a person is involved in different activities and all of these different activities are uh, operate in different fields of meaning. And, and entrepreneurship is one of these and we can talk about entrepreneurial action behavior as operating within this meaning that's defined by, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this shortly, uh, this sense of, of, of opportunity. But before we get there, we need to take a trip, um, having, having mentioned intentionality, uh, we need to get, get a sense of what intention is. And this comes from uh, Searles, John Searles' work. And this late, uh, yesterday, uh, Raghu was talking about uh, was Searles' work around speech acts. And of course, this is a, a continuation of work that starts with Austin and doing things with work and Searles' uh, um, speech acts and expression and meaning. And Intentionality is a book in this, in this series of, of, of works. Mind is a book that comes afterwards. So intention is an example of an intentional uh, mental state. And this is a state that is about something external, whether an object or a state of affairs. And the key thing to consider here is that every intentional state has two components. One is the content, which is the state of affairs raining. And the other one is a psychological mode. I wish it's raining. I believe it's raining. I intend that it's going to be raining and I command it to be raining. So this psychological mode uh, reflects different speech acts or intentional states that I can, that I can uh, have towards that um, content. Another key thing here is a, a sense of direction of fit and uh, a very, very interesting idea by Searle and that's determined by psychological mode. So a belief has a, a mind to world direction of fit. So a belief can be uh, true or false depending on where the belief fits the world. However, a desire and an intention have a world to mind direction of fit. Uh, it can be fulfilled or unfulfilled. So if I intend to do something or desire something, it's not true or false, it could be fulfilled or unfulfilled depending on whether the world ends up matching what I have in mind. And so out of this, uh, uh, there is this also sense, given the, given the content of, of, a, of, of a state, there's a sense of a conditions of satisfaction that determines whether in this, in the case of intention, whether something is fulfilled or unfulfilled. The next comes the, this idea of uh, what Searle calls complex intention. Now, if, I, if you ask an entrepreneur, what, what are you doing right now? Uh, they could say, I'm talking to a customer, I'm developing a product, I'm developing, designing a business model, I'm launching a new venture. And these are all through descriptions of the actions of the entrepreneur because they're done at different, slightly different level of abstraction. And the point here, and this again comes, comes from uh, work in this space, what is known as an accordion effect. An accordion effect is when I do a task that is more complex in nature that requires a sequence of steps. There's one thing that I'm doing now, but there's really something, something broader that I am intending. So this is the, the hence the idea of the, of the accordion. And when we, the, when we apply this to the uh, entrepreneurial setting, uh, we can see a new venture development as an accordion. So there's this idea of a new venture, but of course that's broken down into some milestones and each of those milestones can be broken down into specific steps. And I use here the term theory of change it comes from social policy and, and, and evaluation, um, policy evaluation, which is basically this idea that whatever you're trying to do, when you're trying to achieve an impact, you need to have a sense of the way in which you go about achieving that impact. So I've just borrowed that term from, from that particular literature. And this gives us right now to making that distinction between idea and opportunity that, we, that there's been so much arguments uh, about. So venture idea, that's simply content. That's some stuff, future state of affairs. So we can, we can use the term venture concept here, but that's a, that's, a, that's a thing that doesn't do anything. We can talk about opportunity when that content is combined with a particular psychological mode, someone's intention. And because that intention is complex, we need to combine that with theory of change as well. So opportunity becomes this combination of venture concept, an individual who brings, you know, whose intention that is, and intention is always someone's intention, and the theory of change. So that means without an idea, we can't have an opportunity. Without an individual, without, we can't have an opportunity. Without the theory of change, there's no opportunity. It's just a desire, which could be about anything. It could be a simple fantasizing. Um, crucially, this has a world to mind direction of fit. And the condition of satisfaction, apologies for the train, is the way the future needs to be for, for, that, for that concept to be, uh, to be realized. So here's a summary here. 
of opportunity as an intentional space. Um, I call this uh, opportunity are triangle. You, are you very on the long last trade. slide? Sorry, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's very, yeah. very, well, two slides. Um, opportunity is an intentional space. Uh, here is that idea of world to my direction to fit and conditional satisfaction. Uh, here we bring the scholar in. When the scholar comes in and wants to study the entrepreneur, I, as a scholar, I can try and engage directly with the future state of his stairs or try to study what the entrepreneur does. And I just want to bring your the, um, attention here to the difference between intentional. When I make a claim about the future, it's a belief that can be true or false, and he has a mind to world direction to fit. When I talk about, when I report the entrepreneur's opportunity and what they pursue, when I say the, that the, the entrepreneur pursues opportunity, the truth of that statement is that simply the person is doing that thing. I make no commitment to the truth of the proposition that the entrepreneur has. Where does that leave it with design science? Well, here is where design science is. As a scholar, we can study the future directly. And I call this future science. And a lot of uh, economics modeling comes in that space where we try to model things and explain without really uh, uh, re re reverting to individuals. We can study and describe what entrepreneurs do. That would be behavioral science, simply from the observation from the outside. In design science, when we enter that triangle and try to work with them, Towards, um, towards the future that they, that they, that they wish to um, uh, enact. This, this is my last slide here. So that's the space of design science is the triangle, the combination between framing and modeling and performing. Uh, and I think that's self-explanatory, more of it in the paper, but, but, but let's get to questions. Um, so thank you, Hendrik, for keeping me uh, on time here. Well, and apologies yeah. if, if I went too fast, but uh, you do have the full paper. That's fine. And don't flatter yourself. You were not on time. You are two minutes over. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, uh, no questions in the chat as of yet that I can see. So uh, if someone has a reflection or a comment, feel free to just voice it. Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, yeah, thank you. I that was that was a slide that I I thought was self-explanatory, but it has not so. So uh, framing is simply articulation of the venture complex, uh, venture concept. So framing is, if if you say, if you're an entrepreneur and I ask you what are, you know what are you doing, and you explain I'm trying to start a a, a venture X, and I'm going to push you to to explain more, you know, the, to to articulate the venture concept more more fully. So framing also, uh, I suppose that relates to um, Roberto's uh, talk yesterday about problem setting as well. How do we frame? you know, what the venture is about, what is it trying to do? Modeling on the other hand is, how do we take that concept and turn it into a set of milestones and things that need to be done if that, if that concept is to be uh, realized? So that's the, the link between venture concept and theory of change. Uh, there's also a, uh, a, a question I see around the, uh, the theory of change. As I said, yeah, this could, is- could, could we, could we uh, perhaps Stefan, you could ask that question if you had some more specific uh, take on it. No, I was just uh, curious where, where, where the inspiration and the references came from in terms of theory of change, because it's something that, that, that you know, comes up a lot in social entrepreneurship. And when I work with social entrepreneurs, we talk a lot about theory of change as something that they have to consider. But uh, I was curious about the theoretical backdrop that you derived it from. So um, I'll give you an indirect answer. I had, a, I had a conversation with someone who is in our social policy um, and they do social innovation, social policy part of the university. And we were sitting down and, and talking, about, uh, talking about something. And her first question was, what's your theory of change? And I said, I'm not sure what you mean. And then, and then she elaborated, turns out theory of change, that's a huge, anything you do, some kind of impact evaluation, some kind of a, a policy initiative, you need to have a sense of how you're gonna bring the desired effect. Turns out it's a quite an established thing. And um, our, Chris Argeris and Donald Sean called this, uh, they use the term action strategy, which is very similar to, uh, in, in a way to this, but I've just taken the term from, from social policy. And it basically, if you say, I want to start a venture, the question is, how will you get there? What are the steps that you're going to take? That's what theory of change reflects. Because in evaluating whether, whether you've succeeded or failed, I suppose people want to know what is it that, you, how are you trying to do this? So they can evaluate where exactly you got stuck. 
Yeah, I think it, it's in this tradition of process evaluation, right? Because yes. you don't want to evaluate only on goals. You want to do a process evaluation. And then you need to have a theory of the change process in order to be able to evaluate you know, its efficacy. So Mark, did you want to, uh, to riff on this? No, I mean, that was, that was a good answer. I, I was just wondering, you know, philosophically, the foundations of this theory of change, does it, does it tie into the process theories of Whitehead and some, some of the others? That was just kind of where I was going with that. Uh, my, my sense is that it's from a, a completely different uh, academic tradition. Uh, of uh, and, and maybe some maybe some link into to action research, but from a more indirect angle. But but anything that has to do with with social policy, as I said, social social impact, social evaluation. Uh, that's uh, that's it. So, Jerome, do you want to to ask your question? Uh, yeah. So that's one. Uh, so the venture concept itself it evolves over time. Is there some kind of coevolution going on also with the person? As in, is it also the other way around? Uh, Coevolution between the person and the venture concept. Yeah, um, I suppose yes. I mean, the venture, the venture concept uh, that evolves. Uh, in, in often when you try to explain what is it you try to do, it turned out that uh, you know the, the original thing needs to be modified. So this is this is linked to uh, Ragu's talk about performativity. I, I suppose yesterday, when you try to articulate what it is, you realize that it's actually not like that. It's it's something different. So yes, that's something that that evolves. That's why framing is 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 an ongoing process, and so is modeling. So these three things are, uh, are intertwined. And of course, performing is actually doing the things uh, that, that 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 involves. So uh, Yang Yang, you had a question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding the um, uh, the notion that you put for future science. Uh, uh, we acknowledge that the design science is really helping linking theory and the practice. But I was wondering, uh, could you elaborate a bit more? Is there any particular method you refer to that design science can really help to address or <laughs> moving towards the future science, please. Well, I, I, did, I did have these, as, there are two different types of science and I, I use the term future science loosely here, just as a placeholder for quite a lot of approaches that aim to study what happens in the economy directly. So as I said, a lot of the economic modeling and, and in fact, I would put here uh, the you know the, the judgment view of entrepreneurship you know modeling modeling um, entrepreneurial outcomes in, in the in the in the notion that the judgments that entrepreneurs do is something that's unobservable and we don't need to worry about it because what you need to study is basically infer things from the outcome and this is just a, a placeholder for engaging with the future directly in terms of what with the outcomes directly uh, by by overlooking and, and ignoring and sidestepping what what the um, acting entrepreneurs do. And the contracts with design science is with design science, we actually engage with the entrepreneurs and, and we take the venture concept as they pose it. We take the, the, the impact, the intention, the, the um, aspirations as they have them. Uh, it's something that we, we it's, it's their thing in a way, right? And we can do this the same as scholars. If we step in, become entrepreneurs ourselves, then this is gonna be our process. But in the absence of that, you can think of it as a, a, a second person where we have a close engagement with the, with the active entrepreneurs and trying to improve their art and skill of, of trying to go through this process. Yeah, we have a few uh, questions that are more reflections here, but uh, I think uh, Orestes had a question about uh, consequences for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education and support if you thought that concretely about this model in those terms. Um, so uh, the short answer is yes, uh, almost, it's almost a, a direct consequence of this, apologies for the, for the, for the train. Um, so you can, uh, education, we can focus that on framing. Uh, so this is about communication, articulation, and, and, and um, uh, so that, that aspect. Modeling as well, how do you take from a, how do you take a venture idea and break it down into milestones to actually build it as a working, uh, as a business? Right, that's a that's a that's a part of entrepreneurship uh, education, 
and performing as well. You might say that that's, that's going into practice, but there's lots of things that could be practiced as part of education as well to try and, and develop skills. Uh, and again, that relates against to, um, could relate to communication, uh, selling, planning, financial planning, um, and other. Okay, thank you. So um, there are some comments here that are not really questions, but if someone wants to formulate one of those I, as a question, feel free. I have a question around, because it seems that you look at the venture concept in a theological sense, in the sense of that the concept remains the same, or do you allow for it to be a, like non-theological intentionality? that the concept emerges out of the process? Well, I suppose, um, I mean, it's there because that's at any point, if a person articulate what it is that they're trying to do at any point, they will give an answer and that, that with the current state of the venture concept, if you wish. That's something that continuously evolves, but I cannot imagine that we're, you know, we can talk about um, an entrepreneurial, you know, someone, being an entrepreneur in the sense of they not knowing what they want to do, just doing stuff and hoping that something emerges. That's a, that's a, it's a difficult thing to imagine. Uh, you know, in what way would we, would we, would, would we call that person an entrepreneur? Mm. Demo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do we have a quarrel? Well, I, <laughs> No, no, not a quarrel. Not, in, not intending to be an entrepreneur doesn't mean you have no intentions, whatever in life, right? That, that is true. You could have some yeah, other yeah. intentions. You're working on something and then something happens or you meet somebody. So, uh, and, and more importantly, the best example of non-teleological intention is habit. People do stuff by habit and then something happens and then they change. So, of course, teleology can emerge in the process, right? Uh, there is no particular point in life when life stops and entrepreneurship begins. So that is you, true. So, you, so you that, know but, but that I, this is like a red drag to a bull here saying that, right, Demo? <laughs> no, but all but what, what this is saying, Cyrus, is that you know, saying that we live our lives, and that is that is true. And at some point, we become a bit more deliberate and intentional. And at that point, we can we can so we can talk about entrepreneurship. Then you should say that everything you're talking about assumes that that boundary that once somebody has intention then everything you say makes sense right so well, you the, keep but, non but, but theological think... intention out of your model nothing wrong with that just you have to ac accept that explicitly right yeah i mean i think the opposite the opposite is is the claim is that everybody in around the world is an entrepreneur uh, because they're always at risk of of i know and, and this is you know, there's a danger of, of everything becomes about entrepreneurship because everybody is living through life. Everybody is at the uh, at risk of things happening that could trigger uh, interesting stuff. Uh, and and if if everything is is entrepreneurship, then that becomes a bit. But, but who tricky, is saying that? Conflict. Who's saying that everything is about entrepreneurship? Well, I mean, your your when you were talking about non -tele teleological, you know, life is a non teleological thing. We go through life. And at what point, the question is, at what point we can talk about entrepreneurship? It's I, a tricky boundary can, to pose. I, I'm okay. saying you can, um, as, as scholars, we can uh, express our models and the boundaries of our models, right? We can say that when I talk about it, I'm not considering those other intentions, other situations, that, that's all. But that, that doesn't mean that all of those other situations don't exist, or if we take them into account, everything collapses, right? The, we all uh, the whole idea of uh, scholarship is we are going to build maps of the world, right? So we are saying mm -hmm. we look at this this way, but doesn't mean that reality has to be exactly the same as our uh, as our map. The maps are useful precisely because they don't they're not one hundred percent congruent with reality, right? No, I, 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 I agree. Are useful. Yes. So. Yeah. Uh, just anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to pitch in on Fritjof's question. Uh, and when you said 
you cannot imagine i mean i can give you like uh, i don't know like a, at least a dozen examples right <laughs> well i suppose yes since you the question of boundaries so so i guess what what this suggested is is that at least in 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 what i'm trying to conceptualize uh, there's no point, you know, there's no meaningful discussion about entrepreneurship until there is some kind of articulation of a venture concept. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's not there. Perfect sense. Yeah. That, that, this is, this is what I was, uh, this is what I was, yeah. yeah. But I think, I think this, this goes back a little bit to the discussion we had yesterday about, you know, uh, when, when Saras was again starting a fight with uh, Roberto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about you know meaning and and uh, whether design situation is is like uh, you know uh, problem solving or if it's a broader more kind of related to uh, some sort of inherent appreciation of meaning in a situation and you can kind of reflect on or perhaps design or reframe what something means in a more fundamental way i mean um, the question of where entrepreneurship starts is really you know hard to to draw draw a line on and the, these intentions, as you say, Saras, can come out of, you know, just habitual behavior, just uh, any sort of random thing happening. And, and to draw that line is, of course, impossible. But as you say, Saras, uh, being clear about what one's theory speaks to is important. But I think... Yeah, it's not about drawing the line in reality, right? We're not... I, I'm, I'm never saying, we never need to say entrepreneurship is this and not that, right? You can say that for the purposes is what we are doing here, whether empirically or theoretically or as an argument. For this purpose, we will set the boundaries here. Yeah, Once absolutely. That, then we can have meaningful conversations, right? It's like the old, it's like the old, uh, um, what was his name, Box or something, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. You know, we <laughs> exactly. need to just be clear about what the intended use for our model is and, and, uh, and how it can be useful in that context. But what I was pointing to was the fact that entrepreneurship viewed as this kind of meaningful kind of design, uh, entrepreneurship as designed as this kind of meaning making activity has to kind of grapple with these kind of more vague roots coming before a clearly articulated venture concept as well you know not all theorists need to grapple with that but that's part of it to think about this kind of pre-firm if you will yeah okay situation mm. okay okay i get what you're saying so i think we have time for one more one more question and i'm not going to try to guide it the first one who screams can ask it uh, maybe i can i, was... I can articulate i wrote a comment uh, um good afternoon everybody um, so I was just, I, I'm, I've been reading lately a lot about uh, opportunity discovery and creation. As you said, uh, this debate was kind of uh, uh, very vivid in the past and now it's been somehow accepted that they could be coexisting. However, I was wondering what is uh, uh, your view, Dimo, on the, um, so within your definition, I see opportunity as something that includes uh, somehow the speculative view of the entrepreneur of what could be in the future. So this theory of change and an intention, but then um, my, uh, so my doubt is if uh, an opportunity is discovered, so it exists, um, let's say independently uh, within the market because of an imperfection. So it's just waiting to be discovered then uh, how does entrepreneurial intention play a role within this? So if the opportunity only exists when intention is there, how do you justify opportunities that are just there, you know, standing there? And, uh, and then I, I, building on this, could be, it could be interesting to evaluate uh, when something is not an opportunity. So what, what's not an opportunity? I think I think I'm I'm really sorry, but given that we should have gone on a break a minute, uh, thirty seconds ago, uh, and this is a sorry. really big question, you know, perhaps perhaps you can take this offline, uh, but uh, it's a really relevant question. I agree. But, I, I had uh, such a great answer, but I I'll yeah. unfortunately unfortunately but, handle you know, it. You know, feel free to stay in the room. Me. Feel free to stay in the room. But the rest of us go get coffee now. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, see you back. I'll I'll, I'll stay in the room for two no, minutes. I would love yeah. to know the answer, Dimo. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give an analogy of, uh, um, so forget, I, forget about opportunities for a moment and think about, um, think about marriage and spouses for a moment. And this idea that, that, uh, that there will be someone, someone whom you might marry in the future, right? And this is, so this is, this is the idea that a spouse, a spouse exists waiting to be discovered. 
And it's not quite true because by that logic, every person in the world is, is, is that spouse, right? And so it's, it's only, it's only and the same applies with friendship and customer is this kind of the same, the same concept. So the, 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 there's all these things that are, that are there, but they need to be connected and you need to be, you need to be actively looking and making friendships, uh, for instance. And it's, this, is, this is the way in which creation and discovery are just two ways, two ways of looking. Yes, nothing is discovered, it created out of nothing. Nothing is made out of nothing, but, but the things that we call open, these are relational concepts, they involve connections. And these connections actually have to be made by the entrepreneurs. So that's why I, 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 as, as a discussion, I find it not fruitful at all, whether it's one or the other, because it's both. I see. So, you know, I, I understand the parallel with the marriage. So once, to, I mean, probably the problem is that before, so if it's only there waiting to be discovered, then it's not an opportunity yet. That's probably the, the thing. Yes. So in philosophy, they say that every proposition about the future has, is fractionally true. You cannot rule anything 100%. So it's fractionally true, which means anything you talk about is an opportunity in that sense. But that's meaningless because unless you want to do something about it, it's 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 futile to just sit and discuss in a static in a static way. That's why for me, opportunity is this idea, but married, connected with with action and intention. People actually uh, doing something. Thank you. Sorry for taking off part of your break. I, I, no, I have one uh, additional uh, comment on that, Sylvia, which is. That is one uh, situation in which I think it does matter in the sense that if you uh, think about an individual or a small team trying to start a company, now when they think about opportunity as something out there, they are going, the set of actions they're going to take may be different or the set of actions from which they choose may be different than if they thought the opportunity is something that could be shaped and created. Right. So people's theories about whether it is whether opportunities are out there or they can be shaped can make an actual difference in their action. So in that sense, I think having those frames and taxonomies and worrying about them may be useful, but not as a theory of entrepreneurship. I am not sure it's very useful there. I'm 100 percent with Demo. But in, in terms of an action set or a choice set, uh, your framing of the uh, of an epistemological term like opportunity will make a difference. So, yeah. So that is something to think about. Uh, so that's why I think people keep talking about it because I think that at least there's one point it does does matter. Yeah. 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 I see. I see the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. A quick coffee and back. Uh,